Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Can everybody hear me at the back? Yeah. I remember setting up at the back at a fringe show and I fell asleep, so I hope, I hope if you do, you, you have a good one. Um, my name is... You can't hear us. Can you hear me now? Huh? Yeah, that's better. Okay, my name is Kenneth Pinkerton, and I am partner and head of charities and third sector at Brodie's. I've got a little slide behind me to uh, tell you a bit about Brodie's. We are a full service legal firm, and what that means is, from a charity and third sector point of view, is we do everything that will meet your legal and governance needs. So anything you need, we can deliver. Um, as evidence of that, I thought that rather than just doing your sort of charity and governance seminar as I have done for years, I would invite some colleagues from the Charity and Third Sector team to join me today to say a little bit about what they do and hopefully highlight some things that you might then think when you go back to your organisations, we need to do that or we need to look into that a little bit further. I think that any lawyer who comes along to these things are almost duty bound to point out to charities and charity trustees what their legal duties are under the law. Um, and it really flows through everything that we do. So it's simply by way of reminder, and with no apologies to anybody who knows this already, just to point out that under the Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act 2005, a charity trustee's duties are generally to act in the interests of the charity, and what that means is that you act free from conflict, and when you're in the room acting for the charity, that is what is at the forefront of your mind at all time. And if you can't say that you're acting in the interests of the charity, I suppose what I would say is you have to do something about it. You don't sit in your hands. You act in a manner consistent with your charity's objectives, your charity's constitution. So first point there is you have to know what the constitution says. I think fellow advisors remain amazed at the charities who come to us for advice and we ask for a copy of the constitution say mm, not quite sure where it is or that might not be the re most recent copy of the constitution and finally you have to apply the appropriate standard of care and for charities in the 2005 act that is a standard of care that is reasonable to expect of someone looking after the affairs of another person and that's generally taken to be a higher standard than if you're looking after your own affairs. So with that backdrop, I will now hand over to my colleague, Lynn, who is in our employment law team. Lynn. OK, thank you, Kenneth. Can everyone hear me OK? Good. Um, so I've been tasked with talking to you about some of the employment related risks that might arise in your sector. Um, they are probably very similar to those that arise in lots of different sectors. Um, employment law, as you're probably aware, is a really dynamic area of law. It changes all the time. So we're always getting new legislation. We're constantly seeing new case law, all of which impact on, on you as employers um, and can create various risks. But what I'm going to do is just focus on some of the core risks that um, always persist, irrespective of changes in, in legislation or new pieces of employment law that we see. And those relate largely to unfair dismissal and discrimination complaints. So any um, charity who is, a, is an employer and has employees working for them will or may find themselves from time to time having to deal with issues arising with an employee, whether that's a conduct issue, a performance issue or an attendance issue. Or sadly, you might also find yourself in a redundancy situation where you've maybe lost funding or there's just reduced work and you might be facing a redundancy situation. And in any of those circumstances, you might find yourself um, having to dismiss an employee, which gives rise to an obvious risk of unfair dismissal complaints. Um, now, the reason that presents a risk, there are, there are some financial risks that might materialise as a result of that, because where um, unfair dismissal claims can be brought by employees who have two years or more service, um, if they're successful at an employment tribunal, the awards which can be achieved can be quite significant, particularly for, um, it, it could have quite a dent on your finances. So the awards for unfair dismissal 
generally consist of a, um, a basic award, which is like a statutory redundancy payment or a compensatory award. And, and the limits on the compensatory award have gone up. They go up every year. But the cap on those are now sitting at £105,707. Now, a lot of employees won't achieve that because if their earnings are much lower, they can only ever achieve 52 weeks gross pay. But you can still quite quickly see that if they succeed in those sorts of claims, it can be quite a significant financial exposure. So it is important to think about um, how those risks might materialise and the ways in which you might mitigate against them arising. I, I will also say that there are no employment tribunal fees at the moment. Those were scrapped a few years ago. So it's really pretty easy for employees to bring a complaint in an employment tribunal. They might be spurious claims, but I, I guess that's really just to highlight that everything that you might do might never really stop a claim from materialising. You're always going to have that risk. It's really about how you um, mitigate against that risk sort of turning into something that's a successful claim. And I think that's where you can take steps to make sure that you do really mitigate against the financial consequences that can arise. So in terms of thinking about that, um, the first step in defending any claim of that nature is to think about what the potentially fair reason is that you're relying on for dismissal. I've really just talked you through them. So that is it conduct? Is it capability? Is it um, a redundancy, for example? Or there's another category of some other substantial reason, which I won't go into in detail, but pick your, pick your potentially fair reason. And after that, it's really a question of whether you have acted reasonably in treating that as a sufficient reason for dismissal at the time that you actually dismiss. Um, and, and that's where I think you can probably do the most to mitigate against any risks that might materialise, because there's a bit of a question mark over what you need to do to be acting reasonably. And that's the sort of million dollar question sometimes, I think. That is not set out in legislation. So you won't find the answer to that in the Employment Rights Act, which is where the right to claim unfair dismissal sits. That is really largely set out in case law. But fortunately, it is the sort of case law that is pretty well established. It's not the sort of case law that's changing. You'll all be probably seen lots of cases around things like holiday pay and um, discrimination cases. We've had lots of cases about gender, um, gender as an expression of belief, those sorts of cases. Unfair dismissal law doesn't actually change very much. So that's good news. Um, but what you need to do to mitigate against the risks of those sorts of claims succeeding is to know what it is you need to do to be acting reasonably. Um, and, and that will differ depending on the potentially fair reason that you are relying on. So, for example, if somebody is being dismissed for a conduct reason, you will want to make sure that at the time you dismiss them, you have a, a genuinely held belief that they have done the bad thing that they're alleged to have done. Um, and at the time that you dismiss them, you've carried out a, a reasonable investigation to show that you have reasonable grounds for holding that belief. If it is not a gross misconduct dismissal, um, but there have been a series of um, mis misdemeanours, then you'll also want to show that the employee has had a series of warnings, that they've had an opportunity to improve their conduct before you actually get to the point of dismissal. And if you can do those things, you will hopefully be able to successfully defend any claim that might materialise. For something like performance management, so somebody is not performing in their role, again, they should be given an opportunity to improve their performance before you get to the point of dismissal. So that means putting them into perhaps a, a dreaded action plan or performance improvement plan before you get to that, that point. Redundancy, um, there are slightly different things you need to do there. Um, you will have to be able to show that there is in fact a redundancy situation. Um, you may also have to then carry out uh, individual consultation with the employees affected. So you'll need to tell them they're at risk. You'll need to think about pools for selection, what work is going and who's doing that work, and how will you select them? You'll have to have some fair criteria to do that, as well as conducting um, a, a meeting where you can communicate the decision to them. And of course, any dismissal also requires a right of appeal. So you can, you can see that for each potentially fair reason, um, you'll have to be thinking about what process you will want to have in place to mitigate against the risks arising. So in terms of mitigation, I think best advice is make sure you have processes and policies, make sure they are up to date. There's lots of resources out there that you can use that don't even involve coming to lawyers. I should probably say that, but you know, you can, you can look on ACAS website, for example, it's a really good resource for um, making sure that your policies and procedures are up to date. Um, and anyone that might be conducting such dismissals or processes, it is a good idea to have some form of training for them where you possibly, possibly can. Um, and to try and make sure that decisions are consistently made. So in a conduct case, for example, if you're going to dismiss somebody for a particular kind of behaviour, 
in, you have to make sure the same um, sanction, if you like, is meted out for other people who do the same thing or a similar thing, unless you can justify not doing that. Um, I'm just going to add to that that I have mentioned that these are sorts of claims that can be brought by employees. Um, that, that is only, it's only open to employees to bring unfair dismissal claims. And you might have other kinds of workers in your organisation. As charities, you'll also have volunteers. Um, volunteers do not have the right to claim unfair dismissal. But therein lies a bit of a cautionary tale, because that is why it's so important to make sure that your um, arrangements are put in place for volunteers are, are, are properly constructed and that you don't inadvertently give rise to a situation where you, they're actually employees. Because as soon as they might fall into that category of em being employees, they will start to accrue employment rights. So I think that is a, a, a thing to think carefully of in relation to that. Um, I said I would talk a little bit about discrimination. This is probably a little bit more scary than unfair dismissal because discrimination complaints is something that we commonly find um, arising across all sectors, all kinds of employers, but including charities. Um, and the reason for that is that you don't tend to find unfair dismissal claims come by themselves. They're usually accompanied by a discrimination claim where, where that's possible, because there is no cap on the amount of compensation that can be recovered in a discrimination claim. Um, so the £105,707 I talked about, or 52 weeks gross earnings, you can sort of rip that up and slightly throw it out the window. Now, it doesn't mean that somebody is going to get millions of pounds, but it does mean that if there is a finding of discrimination, um, that they can recover all the damages and losses that flow from the act of discrimination. And if people have maybe come to you, for example, from the public sector, or they do just have a generous pension scheme, or something has happened that they are in some way psychiatrically damaged by the discrimination and they say they will never work again, suddenly those losses can be really very significant. Um, and we have seen, I think, the last tribunal statistics, quarterly statistics, which are actually at the end of last year, but the highest award that was made in a claim was £1.7 million. Now, I don't know what kind of claim that was. It might have been brought by a city banker claiming sex discrimination and will never work again. That's maybe why it was so high. Um, but you do the, the awards in these sorts of cases can be really significant. So trying to mitigate against the risks of discrimination claims um, and educating yourself on how they might arise is really important. Um, and the Equality Act 2010 is the main piece of legislation that we have for that. That's the, the scheme of that act sets out what the protected characteristics are. Don't test me by trying to list them all because no matter how long I've been doing this job, I can never remember them when I'm put on the spot. Um, the one that we <coughs> see most commonly actually coming across our desks is disability discrimination. Um, so people alleging that they have some sort of physical or mental impairment which is placing them at a disadvantage in the workplace. That comes up a lot, largely because there are specific disability-related types of complaints around reasonable adjustments or discrimination arising from disability that can come out of that can come out of that. Um, how can you mitigate against the risks? I, I think the main way of doing that in the context of discrimination is, again, um, you can put in place policies and procedures, dignitate work policies, and you can train people. That's uh, probably a bit of a given, particularly because, and this is another sort of slightly scary point, is that um, if claims are being brought against an organisation for discrimination, they can be brought against the organisation as employer, but they can also be brought against individuals. So anybody that's essentially accused of the discriminatory action. So that can include other employees, line managers as well. Um, and, they, and there can be findings of joint and several liability. So that's something that's maybe a little bit more risky about discrimination complaints. Um, I think having good governance in decision making, so being able to really show the rationale for all decisions that you make in relation to your workers, because that's another point, discrimination claims don't just cover employees, they do cover broader categories of workers, which is a much broader category. Being able to show how you got to your decision um, and show a non-discriminatory reason for any decisions that you take is the main way of mitigating against any sorts of discrimination complaints. Um, so that's discrimination. The last thing I was just going to mention, because I'm sure my time is, is up. Okay. I'm okay, I'm okay. Um, is really just to talk a little bit about some of the things that might be coming up, because as I said at the start, employment law is very dynamic and it's changing all the time. So there are things that will be coming up in 2024 that you will want to be thinking about that might present risks um, for your organisations. And certainly what we can do to help uh, with that is that um, every year, one of our employment 
uh, one of my employment colleagues, one of our professional development lawyers, um, will set out a, a list of all the things that are coming up, or is essentially a checklist of things for you to be thinking about in the coming year. So look out for that. It's a, it comes out usually as a blog at the beginning of the year. Um, but next year, what we might see, and some of you might be relieved to hear this, we might see some changes to holiday pay and how that has to be calculated, some changes to legislation on that. Um, some of you will be familiar with the House of Lords decision in the Harper Trust case last year, um, which was about how you pay holiday pay for part year workers, which was a little bit testing for everyone. There has also been a lot of case law. There's just been another House of Lords decision in a case called Agnew, which is about actually about the calculation of holiday pay, but um, largely is around how far back you can claim holiday pay um, and how it's calculated. So we will possibly see some changes to that, particularly um, because it's one of the areas of European law that is the government are going to have to do something to save or change. So look out for that. The other one I think to be just look out for because it is a piece of concrete legislation is the Employment Relations Flexible Working Act 2023, which has been passed, but it's going to come into force next year. And that will change um, slightly how flexible working requests can be made. Now, that sounds a bit dull, but I mention that because flexible working requests... Um, if they're not granted, can give rise to claims under those regulations. They're not hugely valuable claims, but what is valuable are discrimination claims that can arise if you refuse flexible working requests and you don't have good reason for doing so. So I think because of that act coming into force and the fact that it's going to change slightly how, how um, and when and who can make flexible working requests, I, I think we might see more flexible working requests being made. And if they are refused, then we might see also more discrimination claims arising as a result of them. So they're, they're just some things to look out for next year. There's going to be more, but there's some highlights. <clears throat> Thanks, Lynn. Um, we have built in time at the end for questions, but we're also happy to take questions as we go along. And one of the aims of me bringing together colleagues was um, to really do that and to try and make a session as discursive as possible. So I suppose I should say, if you're wanting away early, no questions. But um, if, as I say, we're all happy to take questions as we go along. So on that, does, uh, does anybody have a burning question just now or would, shall we leave? Yes, we do have mics or you can shout if you can project very well. I can hear you, if it's a question for me. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> There's a whole list of factors. Sorry, so, so for the people in the room, the question was that other than pay, is there anything that tips a, a volunteer into the employment category? Yeah. So there's a number of badges of employment that you need to be concerned with. So if you have, um, if you start to direct employees um, or volunteers rather to work in a particular way, so if you're asking them to <coughs> um, do particular hours, um, at particular times, if they are being very directed, and I, I appreciate that some of this can become quite grey because there's an extent to which you probably have to direct them, um, but if they are being directed and you start to create a bit of mutuality of obligation, subjecting them to employment policies and procedures in your organisations could be something else that might tip them into being employees. So you probably want to make sure that, for example, they um, do comply with things like your data protection policies and um, health and safety policies and dignity at work policies. But beyond that, you probably don't really want to be involved in subjecting them to things like your disciplinary policies, grievance policies. So uh, just being careful about how much um, access you give them to those sort of policies. But I think it largely it's about control. So how much are you controlling the way that they do the work and when they do work and what are the expectations of them? Um, that it, if those if the dial goes too far one way, they can become, that's when they can become employees. Not giving them written contracts or just being careful how you document the arrangement and making very clear that they are volunteers. I mean, normally, they should only really be getting paid out of pocket expenses as well. So I, I think that's probably what you're referring to when you're talking about pay. And presumably, simply by saying you want them to uphold the values of the charity, that's, that's no, fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, because that's, I think that's what we would all expect to see. <clears throat> Any other questions just now? Okay. 
So, um, thanks for that, Lynn. And I'm now going to hand over to Martin. Thanks, Kenneth. Can you hear me up back? Yep, good. OK, so I'm going to talk the next 10 minutes or so um, about data protection and cyber risk. Um, I guess in 10 minutes it's a fairly high-level summary, but I thought what might be worth doing is just picking up on, I suppose, highlighting that the charities in the third sector is not immune to cyber risk. So you'll see lots of stories in the press about organisations being hacked and subject to cyber attacks. But we're also seeing an increasing number of those focusing on the third sector. So you may have seen a couple of months ago a company called About Loyalty, um, which was subject to an attack, or one of their subcontractors was. And they were providing services to charities to help them understand their supporters and donors. So they had a whole load of data around um, donors. Their subcontractor was uh, attacked, and that data was compromised. And what, what happened with that was that a number of charities ended up in the press over that. Um, people like uh, the RSPCA, uh, Battersea Dogs Home um, and others decided to go public with it. Um, I'm not sure they needed to, but actually they ended up in the press. There was a story in the, the Mail on Sunday. And while that story focused on the fact that Elton John was a, you know, a prominent supporter of one of those charities that was all the, the celeb angle, they still actually impact, you know, had that damage to reputation that arose from being subject to to that um, cyber attack. And I'm not sure necessarily that actually, you know, the, the strategy was quite right in terms of how they, how they spoke about and what they said to people. I don't think it reassured people. It actually probably caused more, more worry than, than reassurance. But I think it's just a good reminder that a lot of charities are dependent upon third parties to do certain things, whether that's to run your IT, to look after the data that you have. And that is a key part of your, your risk as an organisation in terms of how that data is handled. And if it is then compromised or attacked, um, then that impacts on you. So even if you're trusting a third party to do these things for you, um, that uh, could cause an issue in terms of um, obligations under data protection law, in terms of uh, obligations towards Oscar needing, for example, to, to report that incident. So before I talk a bit about um, what you can do to manage or mitigate cyber risk, I thought it might be worth just also covering some data protection basics for those of you who um, are perhaps new to, to handling data and, and data protection law. And for the purpose of this session, I think you can really just distill it down into the principles that exist in, in data protection law. So we have seven principles that are in, in UK GDPR, as we now call it, um, post-Brexit. Um, one of them is about ensuring that you only process personal data where you're doing that and it's fair and lawful and you're doing it in a way that's transparent. So you're telling people what you're doing, you know what you're doing and you're only doing it for, for the right reasons, you have a lawful basis for that. Secondly, you only use the information you collect um, for those purposes and you're not then using it uh, for some other purpose. The third principle is you're only collecting what you need for that principle, so what we call data minimization. You should only collect the information about your supporters, your service users, your employees, your volunteers. Um, where you need to have that information for that purpose. You shouldn't collect more than that. You should make sure that information you hold is accurate, um, so it's an accuracy obligation, and keep it up to date um, where that is relevant. Um, and then you only hold it for as long as you need to. One of the things that we see quite a lot is organisations who hold on to data for too long. They collected it four or five years ago. They now no longer have an issue, a, a reason to hold it, but they've still got it because they don't have a record management policy in place. They're not deleting that data when they no longer need it. And if I go back to cyber risk, all that stuff that people had with about loyalty, I suspect a number of them had data sitting there that was historic and they didn't need it anymore. And that causes a compliance risk. So it's really important to think about how long you're holding on to that data. Do you still need it or, or do you not? The sixth principle is around security. So that's ensuring that you have an adequate level of security in place for, for the information that you hold. And that's tested based on the risk to the individual of that information is compromised. So it's not an absolute obligation, but it's adequate, appropriate measures to protect that data. And the more sensitive that information you have, the greater the lens you should go to. So for example, if you're in the health and social care sector and you have medical information, you would need to go a lot further than you would say for an email address or someone who had perhaps donated some money to you. And then the final principle and the one that came in under, under GDPR back in 2018 is you actually have to be able to now demonstrate your ability to comply with all this as an accountability principle. In the past, a lot of people got by kind of retrospectively saying, well, we probably did the right thing. Now you have to be able to show that you had the policies and procedures in place to actually show, show your compliance to those principles. So what does that mean in practice? Well, I think it means knowing what data you collect and why you collect it. You're not just doing that in a sleepwalking way. You're actually understanding why you've got that information. 
Secondly, you need to be clear and explain to people why you have the information, what you're doing with it. So you may tell a different story to your service users, to your supporters or donors, to your members of staff or your volunteers or your trustees. You, each of them you will use their data in a different way and you need to be able to explain, explain what that is. So an auditing process is really good to actually look at what you're doing. If you haven't done that for a few years, it's worth doing that. You've got to be able to manage your compliance. So internal policies and procedures, we talked a bit about in terms of the, the employment side, some of the policies you have in place. Helping your staff to understand how they should handle data, how long they keep it for, what they do with it, how they keep it secure. Policies on remote working, policies on using your own devices, um, policies on data sharing, all of these things you'll, you'll want to look at and have in place and think about how you manage that accountability internally. Who is it that's actually taking responsibility? Do you need to have a data protection officer? Some of you will, um, some of you won't, depending on what, what it is you do. Risk assessment is really important in all this. They're, sometimes they're required in data protection law, but they can be a really good way of managing risks. So doing a data protection impact assessment before you start doing a new activity or, or a new service or using a new piece of technology, um, they can help you to manage your risk and document how, how you've approached that. Data security um, is, is key. Um, you, know, you, you may be very reliant on third parties for this, but think about how you manage security. How do you keep that information secure? Do you know what your third parties are doing if you're using a third party to run your email system or your document management or document storage? How, how are they keeping that information secure for you? Um, and what are you saying to people around that? What about paper records? For those of you who still have paper records, how do you manage, manage that risk as well? And then I mentioned data retention, again, really important to actually think about how, how long you hold all that data and, and what you do with it. And then if you are engaging with third parties, um, then you want to ensure that you, you have proper contracts in place, you've done diligence on your, on your, your third parties so that um, you are managing the risk with those. Okay, so in, in terms of cyber, cyber risk, um, I, I mentioned the about loyalty case um, before, there's been lots of other examples in, in the third sector um, of service providers impacting that. But, when we're talking about cyber risk, we really think about anything where it impacts on an IT system. And it's not just about personal data, it could be about any, any system that you have. It could be your email system, a CRM system if you have one, um, things used for managing your workforce. Um, all of those systems could be potentially subject to attack. They, you might run them, you might use a third party. And all of that could have, could have an impact on, on you, the services you provide, your finances, um, your ability to actually run, run the charity. So, when we're talking about cyber risk, really, it, it's a very broad thing we're looking at. It's not just about your core systems, but also, say, your, your service providers as well. If you're really dependent on a third party, understanding um, what, what risks exist of them, how they, how they manage their, their IT systems as well. It might be a targeted attack. Someone's actually set out to attack you. Um, it might be just someone exploiting vulnerability. People sit and scan um, websites, IT systems to try and find a way in. Um, it might be an insider threat. You may have someone who is an aggrieved employee who decides to do something, um, and we, we, you know, that comes up quite often. Uh, you see that you, you protect your perimeter, but you're not aware of what's happening internally. And the biggest issue is around phishing. So if you're going to do some training on this, or, or, um, is around actually training your, your volunteers and your staff around phishing risk and being able to spot phishing emails, because the vast majority of cyber attacks come out of someone clicking on an email that they shouldn't have done, and that then compromises the system, gives someone access to a password or whatever, and then next thing you know, your systems are encrypted and you no longer have access to, to your data. So it can happen in lots of different ways. And it, you know, as I mentioned, it can impact on your ability to actually operate day to day, it can cause reputational damage. Say you have supporters or sponsors or uh, donors whose data is compromised, they might not want to support you in the future. They might not want to, to give the information it might impact on your ability to um, support your, your service users. Undoubtedly going to cause financial damage um, or financial loss with the cleanup cost um, and uh, management time that's spent in that. And then there's also a regulatory angle as well. So if there's personal data involved, you may need to report that to the Information Commissioner. You might also need to report it to Oscar um, or to the Charities Commission in England, England and Wales. Um, and we're seeing the regulators take more and more of an interest in how um, charities are um, handling cyber risk and what they're doing about that and expecting to, to be told about incidents. So having, having scared you with all that, what, what, what can you do? What questions do you want to take away from today? Well, firstly, understand what, what IT systems you have. What are you actually using? Whose systems are they? And how are they being protected? So ask questions of your IT providers or whoever it is you, you rely upon for this to understand what, what you're doing. Um, 
when you're using third parties, then carry out diligence on them. There are lots of good questionnaires and things out there. We, we have some we can we provide to our clients um, the questions that you will want to ask people about how they manage their systems, how they manage their data. You want to do that. You want to look at business continuity and disaster recovery. I know that sounds like a you know, might sound a very corporate thing to do, but actually it's for every organisation needs to understand how they would cope if that system went down. If it's dependent on you, what, what's your workaround? It might just be a bit of paper, but you want to know what it is you would do in that situation if it is critical to you being able to operate um, day to day. You want to work out who your incident response team is. So who, who is it internally that takes the lead on this if an incident happens? Who, who gets told about it? Do they have external advisors in place or internal people who can help with the legal issues, with the forensic issues, um, with the, the IT issues, reputation management? And have you got a plan? So the, the best thing you can do is have some form of incident response plan which says, this is what we will do um, when we suffer a cyber incident. These are the questions we'll ask. These are the steps that we take. You want to do some staff training around this um, to make sure people know what to do, how they spot or are aware for things that might cause a potential cyber incident, and then who they tell, because the quicker you can act, the better, and the, the less of an impact it will have, the easier it is to recover. And insurance is really important here. I don't know how many of you have cyber insurance, but the cyber insurance does two things. One, it gives you money and pays for, for all the things you need to deal with in a cyber incident and the loss you might suffer. The other thing it does is it gives you access to a whole load of experts um, whether it's cyber forensic people, whether it's lawyers, um, whether it is reputation management people, they come as part of the package. And that is one of the biggest benefits of having that insurance, that when you're there panicking because you've not been through this before, you can call on people who will help you out. So well worth looking at that if you don't have that um, at the moment or you, your general insurance doesn't cover that. And then with all of this, it's about just regularly reviewing what you do, the policies you have in place, testing them. Um, running, running scenarios um, and making sure that your plans actually work um, and then ensuring you have someone who's sitting there actually responsible, ideally at board level, for this um, and is uh, able to then say, take responsibility for that um, and ask the right questions internally. And with all of that, if you can do that, then hopefully that will put you in a good place um, even when the, the worst ever happens. That was all I was going to say just now. I'm sure there'll be some questions. But thanks. I have to or later on. Yep. Thanks, Martin. Does anybody have any questions at the moment? Gareth. Thanks so much for that. Can I just ask specifically around data protection? Um, I'm concerned that people have sort of have lost the plot on subject access, which of course next year will be 40 years old as a right, and people come up with all these sort of uh, silly GDPR excuses, and they just don't seem to be geared up to respond very well. And I think this matters in the sector of two levels. Firstly, there's um, charities that receive requests for access to the data they hold, but also many charities are making subject access requests to third party organisations to try and support the beneficiaries they're working with. And um, do, you, do you agree that there seems to be a, a lot of confusion out there about basic rights around that? I mean, it's meant to be a 30-day response in most cases, I understand, but people don't seem to be complying very well. I, I think so. I, I suppose there's, there's two, two things in that. So I think we've definitely seen an uptick in the number of people submitting subject access requests, particularly in the, the employment context, so in employees who are in the midst of a dispute with their, their employer or, or some form of grievance. Um, but we're also seeing, I think there's a much more awareness of it. So people are asking, asking about, about that and they're trying to exercise their rights. And they are becoming more and more complex to deal with because we all hold far more information than we ever held. To actually review that is an incredibly difficult and complex task in terms of actually finding what, what's moving for. So I think, I think it is something where there is perhaps a lack of, there's an awareness amongst people to ask the question. Sometimes people ask, submit subject access requests without understanding what rights they have and what, what they don't have a right to. And then I think that there's also a bit around sometimes organisations not being fully geared up to deal with that, particularly if they're not in a sector where they have historically received subject access requests. Um, there's lots of good guidance out there from the Information Commissioner you know, on this, the, the very detailed guidance. You don't need to pay a lawyer to, to be told the basics on this. Um, so do, do look at that if you get a subject access request in. Um, but sometimes you do get complex issues around, I don't know, privilege or um, some you know, the application of some of the exemptions around um, negotiations with individuals or third party personal data. It's the other one we see come up a lot. If you've got data that relates to more than one individual, how do you manage that? How do you identify what relates to that person and not to the other? And that's a time consuming process. 
And the biggest challenge I see for, for charities, well, not just charities, for many clients, is they don't have the resource internally to actually review 10,000 emails or whatever it is their IT search has come up with. Um, and that makes it a very expensive time consuming process. So there are tools out there that can help you with that. Um, but it, 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 they are complex and challenging things to, to deal with. Do you want to come in? I, I was just going to add, because you mentioned the employment side of things. We, that is something we see an awful lot of, our data subject access requests. And I always find myself when I'm advising clients to generally on anything to, to do with employment law. So have you got a data retention policy? What data are you keeping? Don't keep it if you don't have to, because if you get a subject access request, as Martin says, it's, you end up with hugely disproportionate amounts of information relating to an individual that have got nothing to do with the thing that's actually in dispute. And also I think there's not a, there's not a sufficient awareness sometimes about the data that's being captured in organisations. So in the employment context particularly, you get what people are doing is they're making these subject access requests because they think they're going to get a smoking gun. Something that's, you know, that there's something really awful and discriminatory comment or something in an email between a couple of people. And, you know, to be honest, quite frankly, sometimes there is. So what people write down and what people retain is really important. They should just don't write stuff down if you don't need to write it down anywhere on a bit of paper or in, or, or electronically. Um, think about why you're creating stuff and why you're keeping it and how long do you really need to keep it for. So Microsoft Teams is the current biggest issue because Teams by default mm. retains everything forever mm. unless you change it. Um, and people write in Teams a whole lot of stuff that they don't think anyone will ever read. Um, I, can, I can say that with, with certainty because I've seen some of the stuff that has been turned out in searches on that. Um, it's used as a chat function. People are not aware of that. So again, there's a huge education piece around how people communicate, as, as Lynn says, what, what they commit to writing electronically um, as opposed to saying on a, on a phone call or, or whatever. Or text messages. Uh, text, or me text, text messages, WhatsApp, <coughs> yeah. It, it just, yeah, it's, it's um, quite, yeah. quite eye-opening sometimes. And, yeah. Did I see another hand? Yes, sir. Thank you. It's Nigel Over. I support um, smaller rare disease charities. So either have maybe one part-time member of staff or is volunteer red. Now, my question follows on from this question of um, data retention. Is um, There's different requirements under legislation for lengths of period that you need to retain data. Mm -hmm. Board meetings, for instance, is 10 years. Financial is um, six years after the current year. Um, if it's a disciplinary action on uh, staff members, that could be about six, six months. Um, but good practice is the expectation on organisations to take um, planned backups and archiving. So typically backup on a daily, a weekly, a monthly, a free monthly, an annual basis, maybe even retaining those annual archives for potentially seven or, te or ten years to meet these um, legislative requirements. But this conflicts then with um, the things like employment law and losing of data, um, which always gives questions of how do we manage this one? And is there actually anywhere a comprehensive guide as to what data needs to be retained under which piece of legislation and for how long? That's a very, a very, very good question. And I, I don't know, I mean, the, 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 there are things out there, and certainly we, we've had a, a, um, a records management textbook, which we have in the office, which is an excellent guide to that, but I don't know of any publicly available sources, but it's, it's certainly something that I think is worth looking at whether we can we can help you with more, more guidance than that, because data protection law doesn't set out any required period. It just says you must not keep data long, no longer than it's necessary for the purpose, but you have to be able to justify that purpose. So as you say, that for financial information, there are minimum requirements. Beyond that, there's not a huge amount of other things where you have to keep it. It's more that if you say um, you might want to keep something for six years in case you are sued under a contract or by, by, by an individual. Um, and so you would want to keep it for that in order to protect your own position. But after that time period has passed, there's actually probably not very much you ever need to keep. Um, certainly for, for most sectors, you know, there are specific rules in some areas, but for the most part, there's not is more that you would want to keep it to manage your risk. And that's where you have this confidence in, well, what, what is the necessary period? Well, I want to keep it for six years because someone may, may have five years to sue me on a particular um, thing, and I want to have clear records from that period. OK, thank you. Uh, last question for the minute, and then we'll, we might come back at the end. 
if as an organisation you, you don't um, sanction the use of WhatsApp, but you know it's being used by colleagues, possibly even senior colleagues, or um, does that mean it is by default almost sanctioned, even though you have a policy against it? And would WhatsApp messages be recoverable in the event of a SAR? Yes. Yeah. So if, if, if they are being used, if you know that senior management is using it, or even man line managers are using it for work purposes or charity purposes, then it's within scope because you know about it. Even if you say you shouldn't be using it, if you if you know about it, it's happening, and therefore it's within scope. So um, the, the answer to that, I think, is to say, well, if you know people are using something like that, either put in place a policy to allow them to use it or provide them with another communication tool that is just as convenient and easy to use and people then don't fall back in using WhatsApp. Um, and the biggest, you know, one of the issues Kenneth and I have been talking about recently is people who have, say, WhatsApp on a personal device because it's on, embedded on your personal device with a whole load of messages, what happens when that person ceases to be an employee or a trustee of that charity? What are they doing with that? How is the charity then managing that in terms of saying, you should be deleting all of that? How do they know what's there? Um, but yeah, you can't get round data protection law or indeed any disclosure process under litigation just by doing something in WhatsApp rather than through an official email account. Okay, thanks, Martin. Um, we'll now move on to our, my final colleague today, Kate, who is in our insurance and risk team. Um, over to you, Kate. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, yep. Um, I advise charities in a range of circumstances, really, which can be very diverse as, diverse as the activities of a charity. And I advise before things go wrong, I suppose, about how the risk of them happening can be reduced, but also after things have gone wrong, when really what we're looking at is reducing the impact of what's happened. And so today, I wanted really just to highlight two things that have come up recently when I've been speaking to charities and they cover, I suppose, both sides of that. Um, and the first is understanding and reducing the risk of things happening that you don't want to happen. Uh, and that really is a good example of understanding what your duties are as well. So in terms of health and safety duties, uh, an employer uh, owes a duty to manage the risk to the health, safety and welfare of not just its employees, but also of any individual who might be impacted by your activities. So that would be service users, but it might be someone that's walking past a shop front that you have and a sign blows off and whacks them on the face. It's not just the people that you are, you're, you're sort of closely working with. Um, so you have duties towards people that are not maybe within your, your, your immediate scope of vision, but also you have duties in relation to what other people do. So kind of tying in to what Martin was saying about where you use a third party provider for um, your IT needs, um, where you're using third parties to come in and do stuff for you, it might be painters and decorators, it might be cleaners. It, they have their own duties, but they could put your people at risk and you might be liable if something goes wrong. And equally, you could be um, liable if something happens to those people that are coming onto your premises or doing things on your sites. And so it always sounds really trite when we give this advice, but if you are to manage your health and safety responsibilities and to keep the risks as low as you're obliged to, you need to understand the risks generated by your organisation, you need to understand what it is you're doing. And that, that's not always straightforward. For example, if you have merged with other charities or if you've taken on responsibilities or activities that were previously done by other organisations, people who are making the decisions about health and safety might not have visibility of that or they might have lost sight of actually just what all of what you do is. And so having that overview of what it is you do is key and understanding the risk generated by it too. So if we're looking at third parties doing stuff for you, you don't have an absolute duty to ensure that what they do is entirely safe and you're not going to be liable just because something they do results in an accident. But you do have to do, and again, going back to what Martin mentioned, due diligence. Who is it that you're, you're dealing with? Have you gone for the cheapest person? that's probably not going to be uh, the least risky option. You would need to satisfy yourself that the organisation or person you're contracting with is qualified to do what it is you want them to do and also that they're responsible. And once you've decided that this, this is the right 
organisation to go with, you need to ask them, well, what, what is your health and safety policy? Um, how do you manage risk? How do you train your employees? And also on a practical level, what is it you're going to be doing? When will you be on my site? Who will be on my site? What will they be doing? Um, and that's important to protect your people from them, but also to protect them from things that might put them at risk on your site. So there might be access issues, there might be areas you don't want them to go to because you can't keep them safe there. There might be things they can't do on your premises for reasons particular uh, to your operation. So there's, a, there's an element of communication that needs to go on and it can't be a case of simply thinking, well, that's a third party organisation, that's their problem. Um, we've done our bit by, by paying them and we've kind of washed our hands of it. It is an ongoing responsibility and there is an ongoing responsibility to check that they are doing what they say they would do. So, you know, quite often organisations will come on board and they'll say, this is our policy, this is our training policy, this is how we deal with things. In reality, on the ground, that's not what you're seeing. And so you couldn't turn a blind eye to that, much like with the WhatsApp messages. If you know it's happening, you really are, you are under a duty to do something about it. So... I mention that really just because it's the kind of thing that people are maybe blind to and it might not, might not be aware of the duty until something goes wrong and it's a horrible surprise to find out that your organisation could have liabilities. Second thing I wanted to touch on was insurance. So obviously insurance cannot reduce the risk of something happening just by having an insurance policy. You've not protected yourself against that but it can reduce the impact it has on you in terms of finance, in terms of the practical elements of the time it takes to deal with a claim, but also the emotional impact of a claim on an organisation um, when it comes forward. So the first thing is to ensure that you actually have insurance cover. And so things like cyber risk, for example, abuse, are things that are very often taken out of general liability policies. They're not included by default. You would actually have to ask the insurer to, to add them in. You have to essentially buy it as an extra. So it's ensuring that what your policy has, even if it's badged as all risks, checking actually does it cover all the risks that I would like to have cover for. Um, and then once you have the cover, it's understanding what it is that's covered. Is it covering you for things that happen? things that go wrong during the period of the policy, or is it covering you for claims that are made during the period of the policy? And that can have quite a big impact on your cover. Um, and it's also a record keeping issue because it, where your policies cover you for things that happened during the policy period, you need to know what policies you had in place 20 years ago if you're, if you're gonna face a claim for something that's, that's a, what we call a long tail risk. So say a disease claim for someone that's been exposed, exposed to asbestos. You're not going to know that you've made them ill for at least 20 years. So you need to know when they come forward what policies you had in place back then. Um, and the final thing I wanted to mention is complying with your insurance policy. So ultimately, an insurance policy is a contract. Your insurer agrees to give you money um, when certain things happen, but you agree to follow um, certain rules and meet certain conditions in return for that financial payment. Um, and back to the, in the context of abuse claims, the condition of cover for abuse claims is often that you have a safeguarding policy that meets certain requirements. Those are generally uh, the kinds of requirements you would already have in place, but you just need to be clear that you understand what you've signed up to and what you've agreed to do in return for the cover. There are other requirements and, and these can often be missed in the, in the midst of something going wrong. And a key one is notification. So, if something happens or if circumstances come to your knowledge that you think actually that might give rise to a claim, hasn't, there hasn't been a claim yet and no one said they're going to make a claim, but there are circumstances which I could anticipate might lead to a claim, you must notify your insurer. Um, and that can really, that can be quite disastrous if you don't, and it's understandable why you might not, because you might be told about something and you might be dealing with reporting it to Oscar. You might be dealing with a police investigation or a health and safety investigation and telling your insurer may well not be top of the list of things you feel you really must do. But in order to preserve the insurance cover, notifying your insurer when you become aware of the circumstances or the fact that something's happened, it, is key and it is not the case that you don't have to do anything until a claim comes um, in in the mail. 
Um, and so these are things I just really mentioned that they've, they've come up to me personally in the last few months as issues that charities are grappling with and really to try and highlight some pitfalls that I think that can be easy to walk into, um, but equally easy to avoid if, if the right approach is taken um, up front. Thanks, Kate. Um, any questions for Kate? You may all be rushing home to check that your, your insurance is, I suspect. And that wouldn't be a bad thing if, if that was the one thing that people did. I, I would say that we've achieved what we set out to do. Um, for my part, um, and just circling back, uh, to the beginning, I outlined the charity trustee duties. And I think what we've evidenced today is how complex it is to be a charity trustee. We are, after all, volunteers. And many of us do our charity trustee obligations, fulfil them in the evening on a, on a laptop, some of us um, on a phone. And um, I recall Maureen Mallon, the first year that she was appointed um, as Chief Executive of Oscar, saying, your charity trustee duties come into play on day one of you becoming a charity trustee. We don't have a year to bed in. Sometimes we have that in our mind when we join a board. Or, you know, year one, we'll, we'll get to grips with what's happening in the charity. But from a legal perspective, that liability and that obligation to fulfil duties starts on day one. And so how can we help ourselves? How can we help our co-trustees with that. And I think one of the things that we can do to help mitigate the risk of challenge around that is have a good induction programme for trustees coming on the board. And indeed, um, I'm a member of Scotland's Third Sector Governance Forum, and we commissioned a piece of work a few years ago. And what that showed was that we can do better as a sector. We can better help our oncoming trustees and that would be as basic as sharing the constitution. Is there a code of conduct, a, sort of a pack of papers, teach them, help them? That is how we will get people into the sector. That's how we'll get more volunteers. We will you know, make them feel comfortable with their legal duties. There are lots of sessions like these. We have shameless plugs up on the screen. I'm being sent up to Inverness next week to deliver charity trustee training. There's one in our office that we are delivering with Rathbones and Safries on the 15th of November. There's a lot of free training out there. There's a lot of really good stuff that will help charity trustees get to grip with their obligations. And then there is during your trusteeship. Um, do you ask your trustees, have they attended any seminars during the year? Some form of ongoing learning is very important. It's not a matter of you turn up for a 40-minute session at the start of your charity trustee uh, role, when you might have a million other things in your head, getting to grips with the people, the chair, the personalities involved. Um, are you thinking about that? And then when it comes to the end, and, and in, uh, I've had a couple of questions recently about people ending their trusteeships um, and what do they do there? Um, have you resigned properly? What do you actually do when you come off? And it made me think, I don't know if I've ever gone and checked Companies Registers House um, to make sure that I've actually been taken off uh, company's house. I have now, um, but it came up, and it came up in connection with a skill, which then went into liquidation. And the the charity, well, the former charity trustee, got in touch um, to say, "I've got a chain of emails. I, I think I've resigned. Have I resigned?" And of course, what we have for skills at the moment is just an obligation to keep a trustee register, which would almost be. Um, definitive, and hopefully that with um, the new changes coming round the corner in the 2023 Act and Oscar having um, you know, a live, up-to-date register, as it were, for individual charities that you can go in and see, you'll be able to double-check that. But I think that other end is important as well. When you resign, make sure that you have effectively resigned. Don't rely on just sending an email to the chair. Make sure the chair has told anybody, everybody. If you're a trust, then make sure there is a minute of registration done, a resignation rather done. 
And on that, circling back to another piece of advice that Martin and I have been involved in recently with a resigning trustee who had organised a Halloween party, had um, personal data of other individuals, um, and she came to us. And the one thing I want to mention, um, and Martin, if you can come in here, some of the information was on a, a domain name with the charity, and some was on her personal email. And she was asking us about, OK, I've dealt with the handing over the codes and the password for the charity's name, but what do I do with the stuff that I've got on my own personal email address? And I suppose that comes back to a question as well as to why it actually is important to have the domain name as the charity. Yeah, I mean, certainly what we say to charities so with the charity's hat on is try to avoid trustees, volunteers, whoever, using personal email accounts for um, a charity business, because if they are using their own account, you have no idea how secure that is. They might just have password one as their, as their password. Um, there could be a whole lot of sense information in there that they, they see in, in their role that you are responsible for under data protection law, but you've got no way of managing that risk. So recommendation number one is to try and avoid people doing that. If, if you have people who are um, using personal accounts then when someone leaves, you would want to take them, or well, you need to delete all of that from your system, give them guidance around that, policies where they manage that, ensure they have a secure password during the, their time, and, and they move it at the end. I suppose that if you are that individual and you're leaving, then you should be deleting that stuff. You may feel there's some stuff you want to hold on to um, for particular reasons, and in this case, the individual did want to retain some things because they, they were concerned they might need to go back to that. You've got to make a judgment on that as to whether you know, you, you're comfortable doing that and you can keep it in a way that's secure. But if, if you were an employee of an organisation, when you leave, you no longer get access to your email account. So all the stuff you did during your, you know, your time as an employee, you wouldn't have access to. Why would it be different if you're a, if you're a trustee? So that's kind of the lens to look at it through. But from a, a charity's point of view, then actually, you know, if you can set up and provide, say, trustees, staff with an email account that you can manage, you're much more able to manage your, your risk. Thanks, Martin. Um, we are pretty much at the end of the session. Um, it's left to me to thank my colleagues, Lynn, Kate and Martin, for joining me today, and to thank you for coming along. We will be about for the next 10, 15 minutes, if you want to catch us in the foyer, to ask a question. Do sign up for our regular updates um, from Brodie's and from the charities uh, unit. We'd be delighted to hear from you, and it's just for me to say to you, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and tomorrow as well if you are staying. Thank you.